Thank you, Drain. Thank you. Um, we got a lot to cover, not a lot of time to cover it. All right. Amelia Earhart. We're going to talk about finding Amelia with hard facts and sound science. Now, what do we mean by hard facts? Well, we're talking about historical documents from the time. We're talking about datable photographs, identifiable artifacts. And how about anecdotal recollections, things people remember? No. <laughs> people remember stuff wrong. I do, you do. Anecdotal recollections are important. It often starts with some, you know, I remember. The, it gives you something to check out. But by itself, it is not evidence. Sound science? Adherence to the scientific method of inquiry. We formulate and test hypotheses. That's how we go about this. And we have to end up with replicable results. If I come up with a conclusion and say results to the testing of our hypothesis, you should be able to do the same thing we did, if you're crazy enough, and get the same results. All right. And we're going to apply them in our NICU 9 expedition. Now, this will be our 12th trip to Nicomororo. And why is it NICU 9? Because there were expeditions that were preliminary expeditions that we couldn't talk about, and then we ended up, and anyway, the numbering got screwed up. <laughs> it's NICU 9, it's our 12th trip. And we're going to test the hypothesis. The, the remains of the Earhart aircraft lie on the western reef slope of Nicomororo within one mile of the reef edge. Very specific. What's Nicomororo? Well, it's a coral atoll. It's in the middle of nowhere. 1,800 nautical miles south of Hawaii, 700 nautical miles south of Samoa, 1,000 miles northeast uh, of Fiji. It's a classic coral atoll, a ribbon of land surrounding a lagoon, and the whole thing's protected by a fringing reef. It used to be known as Gardner Island. This used to be the South Seas whale fisheries in the, in the 1820s. And it, Gardner Island was named for the congressman from Nantucket, Gideon Gardner. That's what the area looks like that we're going to be searching in, in, so, in say, um, sea beam sonar. It's a rough, rough area. It's a craggy underwater mountainside. This is the first uh, aerial photograph of this section of the island. It was taken December 1st, 1938. And you can see the old shipwreck that was there. That's a British freighter that went aground on the reef in 1929. The first work party uh, arrived there, December 20th, 1938, when the British decided to uh, put a colony on the island. These were Pacific Islanders from the Gilbert Islands, and they were going to raise coconuts. And the, the British needed to relieve some population, uh, overpopulation problems. So the place was uninhabited until December 20, 1938. This picture was taken during the war, January 27th, 42. You can see the back end of the shipwreck is broken off, but you can also see that the area has been cleared up here. That They've started to uh, establish the, the, the village. And, whoops, you know, this, this happens sometimes, doesn't it? How, how did you undo it? The square one. The little square. The, the little the, square one? Looks like it's got a screen on it. Yeah, okay, got it. The uh, settlement was abandoned in 1963 because of a severe drought. And nobody's lived there for over 50 years now. We started going there in 1989. When we went there in 1997, we chartered a ship that uh, had been used by the New England Aquarium to do some, under, some marine biology around Fiji. The people that ran the ship did some diving here at Nicomarora and said, whoa, this place is absolutely incredible. It's got a pristine coral reef. We've never seen anything like this. They went back. They told the New England Aquarium. New England Aquarium came out, looked at it, and said, you're right. This has got to be protected. They went to the, to the country that owns the island. It's the Republic of Kiribati. And they said, we've got to protect this. They did. They uh, set up the Phoenix Islands Marine Protected Area, world's largest marine preserve. It's now a UNESCO heritage site, and it is the focus for climate change research because this is where El Ninos are born. 
And the coral reefs, especially the deep reefs here, are predictors for what's going to happen elsewhere. So there's tremendous interest there. And we feel really proud that the attention that resulted in all this came from our search for Amelia Earhart. And I think Amelia would be proud of that, too. So let's talk about the mystery. February 12, 1937, Amelia announced that she was going to fly around the world. And on March 17th, she took off going from Oakland, California to Hawaii. It was going to go around the world that way. But in trying to take off for Howland Island, her next stop on March 20th, she lost control of the airplane and wrecked it. The airplane had to go back to California for repair. And on May 20th, she started again, this time going the other direction, going from uh, west to east. She went on around the world until she got to lay in the territory of New Guinea. She arrived there on June 29th, 1937, looking a little tired. But two days, three days later, uh, she looked pretty good. This, by the way, you, you'll see pictures in books, the last picture taken of Amelia. This is the last still photograph taken of Amelia Earhart, as far as we know now. And this picture only came to light two weeks ago. Thing, and this is something that's amazed me throughout the whole 28 years that we've been investigating this. New stuff keeps cropping up. That's why we try to attract media attention and people who have information say, hey, I've got something they might be interested in, and they come forward with it. And it's, it's been fantastic. And that's how this happened. Somebody said, I've got a picture. And he had, this person had a letter that verified who took the picture, why they took it, what date they took it. That's a fellow named Frank Howard. He was the uh, representative of the local oil company, and they had just refueled her airplane after a test flight she made on July 1st. Apparently, nobody took a still picture of her the next day when they left. But this is... Hang on, let's play the film. This film was taken on July 7th. Now, actually, this part was taken on the test flight on the 1st, because she's got the same shirt on. There's Fred, looking pretty good. This starts on July 2nd. They get aboard the airplane. The engines are running. You can see. They taxi out to take off. Airplane's loaded more heavily than it ever has been. The thing will barely fly. She hauls it off the ground. It's in ground effect, staggers out over the ocean. Come on. 2,556 2, miles, 19 hours from Ley to Howland Island. This is what the Pacific looked like in those years. It was mostly British territory, colonies. The Japanese are way up here in the Marshall Islands. She, she didn't have enough fuel to get to anywhere the Japanese were. That's what Howland Island looks like. Not much of a target. Waiting for her there is the Coast Guard Cutter Itasca, commanded by Werner Thompson. At 7.42 in the morning, Itasca hears her say, We must be on you, but cannot see you. But gas is running low. Been unable to reach you by radio. She, they've been transmitting to her, and they haven't had any reply from her. And they think she's just blowing them off. This is the first time they learn that she wasn't hearing them. We are flying at 1,000 feet. What? She'd been cruising at 10,000 feet. Why is she down so low if she's trying to see an island? Higher, the better to see. Well, this is why. That's what it's like out there. This photo was actually taken out to the east, uh, no, to the west of Howland Island about the time of day she was trying to find the island. Every morning out there, you get a scattered deck of clouds that cast shadows. If you're above the scattered deck, you don't see anything. All you see is this carpet of white. You get down below it, and what you see are a bunch of shadows. Howland Island is in that picture, folks. Can you spot it? An hour later, she says, we're on the line, 157337, running online north and south. <clears throat> if you're a celestial aerial navigator like Fred Noonan, there's nothing mysterious about this. This is exactly what she should be doing. The line is a line that Noonan could get 
after sunrise, by taking a sighting of the rising sun, he can draw a line on his map that goes 337 one way, 157 the other way. He knows how fast he's going. He can advance that line through his intended destination and know that when, he, when the time is up to have reached the line, that Holland Island is going to be on that line. Now, he doesn't know where he is on this line. He may be up there, he may be down there. If he's right on course, he's going to look out the window and see Holland Island. But if he doesn't, at least he knows, well, it's either this way or this way. And she says, we're running on the line north and south, exactly what she should have been doing. And if she's running to the south, and she doesn't get to Howland or Baker Island, which is also up there, where it's the only other island she can get to. But after that transmission, nothing more. Nothing more was heard from the airplane in flight. A massive sea and air search failed to find any trace of trace of the missing flight, and at the end of it, they issued a verdict that uh, the airplane, five minutes after that last radio transmission, the plane landed on the sea to the northwest of Holland Island within 120 miles of the island. This photograph, by the way, is actually a Lockheed Electra in the water. It was a Lockheed 10E that was ditched off Cape Cod in 1967, so we know what a Electra looks like floating in the water. Well, what are the theories about what happened? Crashed and sank. That was the original theory. Captured by the Japanese. Or landed and died as a castaway. And nobody was talking about landed and died as a castaway until we started looking into it. Crashed and sank. Let's consider that. Well, it's the default explanation. It's a tiny island. It's a big ocean. And the most logical explanation is that she just couldn't find it, ran out of gas, crashed at sea, sank without a trace. They never stood a chance of finding her. End of story. Blizzard, there's absolutely no evidence that that's what happened. She never said, I'm going down, mayday, mayday. She said, I'm running low on gas, and I'm running on this line and going north and south. That's the last thing she said. She never said she's going down. The, the Navy search didn't find an oil slick, a floating life raft, debris, nothing. Oh, how about capture by the Japanese? Well, uh, there are a lot of anecdotal recollections. And we know about anecdotal recollections. It's a false premise. The Japanese had no motivation to abduct her. Why it's always said captured, I don't know. We weren't at war with Japan. Why don't they kidnap, maybe, abduct, captured? No. This is wartime thinking. Um, Oh, they, they needed that Electra. They'd do anything to get their hands on a Lockheed Electra because the Zero is based on some designs that they got. The Japanese bought a Lockheed Electra from Lockheed in 1935. They had their own Electra. They didn't need her Electra. There is no supporting evidence, despite all the books and the articles. No, didn't happen. Landed and died as a castaway. Hmm. That's Gary Larson in 1992. <laughs> Is there reason to think that it happened? Well, let's, let's look at what happened after she disappeared. People started hearing radio distress calls from the airplane. And they were verified. Everybody, she's out there. She's calling for help someplace. Itasca heard a transmission this is 6.30 p.m. on the day she disappeared. She's at noon, she disappears in the morning. At noon, she has to be out of fuel. And yet, six and a half hours later, we hear her. Uh, this is her primary transmitting frequency, 3105. Very weak and unreadable voice. But they've been listening to it. They recognize her voice. There's no doubt in their mind. They hear her. And then British warship Achilles and a freighter called the New Zealand Star. And I hit that. Darn button again. Uh, here dashes in response to a request from Itasca. They, they both hear transmissions on this frequency. And then Mabel Larimore, a housewife in Amarillo, Texas, now she's listening to her shortwave radio set, and she's listening, she stumbles on a harmonic of 3105. Harmonic signals travel much, much further, but they're much more sporadic. Sporadic, So you never know when you're going to pick them up. 
Mabel hears Amelia Earhart saying that her plane is down on a small, uninhabited, uncharted island, part on land, part in water. Navigator Fred Noonan, seriously injured, needs help immediately. She has some injuries, but not as serious. And then Nauru hears the same voice that they heard from the plane in flight. And a ham operator in Melbourne hears something. And the government radio operator on Baker Island, now this is a day and a half after she disappears, hears, that, that was her radio uh, call sign, K-H-A-Q-Q. Heard K-A-K-Q-Q on 3105, strength four, readability seven. That's four out of five, seven out of ten. That's a strong, clear signal. So she's out there calling for help, and they recognize this at the time. And they're all thinking that the airplane's out there floating around someplace calling for help. And then another shortwave listener, Dana Randolph, he's a 15-year-old boy in Rock Springs, Wyoming. He hears her on a harmonic. This is Amelia Earhart, ship on a reef southeast of Howland. On reef? Maybe, you mean she's not floating around? And then the... The next day, the uh, Pan American Airways Direction Finding Station in Hawaii, now they've got, Pan American has stations across the Northern Pacific because they've been flying passengers across the Northern Pacific for a year, and they've got these direction finding stations to guide the clippers. They're, they know Fred, he worked for them, and they take bearings on these signals, and the one in Hawaii gets a bearing that goes, well, that, does, that doesn't make much sense. Okay, that one, you know, okay, that's in the area where we think she ended up. Uh, Midway, another Pan Am station, they take it. That doesn't, uh, wait a minute, oh, uh, Hawaii got another one, same area. Wait a minute, Midway got a better one. Oh, it crosses with those, that's pretty good. Wait a minute, Howland Island has a direction finder, and they get a bearing. They're not sure which way it goes, but it crosses the other ones. And then Wake, the other Pan Am station. Wait a minute, we really got an indication here of where these signals are coming from. And then this comes along. Information received from Lockheed Aircraft Company states positively Earhart's plane radio transmitter could not repeat not operative plane in water. She can't be in the water. She's got to be on land. Well, let's go back. What's Gardner Island? Okay, we got to do something about this. The battleship Colorado is steaming south, going as fast as they can, but it's 1,800 miles. And by the time they get down into that area, the mysterious radio signals have stopped. They refuel the Atasca on July 7th. And on July 9th, they launch their airplanes and fly over Gardner Island. This photograph was taken from one of the Colorado Corsairs on that morning. Um, that's Gardner Island, the lagoon, the ribbon of land, the reef, the tide's high. The north arrow points due west. But the senior aviator in the search says that signs of recent habitation were clearly evident. They didn't see an airplane down there, but they were under the impression that all these islands had native work parties harvesting coconuts. Nope, there had been no work party, nobody on this island since 1892. There should have been no sign of recent habitation. But they didn't see an airplane. They crossed the place off as having been searched. And when no aircraft was seen on land, it was assumed that all of the reported post-loss radio signals must have been hoaxes or misunderstanding of messages sent to Earhart. They had all this evidence that said the airplane had been on land sending messages coming from this particular island area and maybe this particular island, but when they didn't see an airplane there, they said, oh, must have been, must have been bogus somehow. The aircraft carrier Lexington took over the search and with its planes searched all the purple areas you see and found nothing. And the one place where they had all the evidence, they crossed off after a 20-minute cursory aerial inspection that saw something that shouldn't have been there. We did an analysis of those post-loss radio signals. Could these be proof that Earhart did not go down at sea? Well, let's do our hard facts. 120 reported radio distress calls spanning six days. At least 57 are credible. That's the result of a 12-year study of radio propagation content, searching out all the messages, evaluating them, 
as objectively as we possibly can. And when we say they're credible, it doesn't mean that they're genuine. It just means we can't find any other way that this electromagnetic phenomenon could have recur occurred and been heard by the people who heard it in the way they heard it if it wasn't Earhart on that island sending messages. So let's develop a hypothesis and test it. Okay, the hypothesis is Earhart made a relatively safe landing at Gardner Island and sent radio distress calls. Why has it got to be a safe landing? Because the radio depends on the battery, and the battery has to be recharged by an engine. So she can't send radio calls unless she can run her engine to recharge the battery. And this goes on night after night. She's got to be able to recharge that battery, and she'd be crazy to send signals uh, without the engine running, because if she runs down the battery, she won't be able to get the engine started, and then she really is up a creek. So she's got to get an engine started, and in order to get an engine started, she's got to have clearance to do that. Well, all right, 47 messages heard by professional radio operators around the Pacific that appear to be credible. One ham in Melbourne. Around the United States, there were other people like Mabel Larimore and Dana Randolph. They heard nine messages, all on harmonics of her frequency, and they stumble across them. They're not listening for her. They're just cruising the dial like surfing the web, and they stumble across Earhart calling for help. And the most interesting one is in St. Petersburg, Florida. Betty Clank, she's 16 years old, and she's listening to her home shortwave set, and she hears Amelia calling for help. And she's got a notebook that she keeps by her radio that she uses to jot down the lyrics of her favorite songs and make sketches and stuff. She grabs her notebook and starts transcribing the phrases that she hears. And this goes on for an hour and three quarters. And we've got her notebook. I, we knew Betty, she died last summer. But uh, we've, we've got her notebook and we've analyzed it very carefully. And it's really interesting because what she heard is not just a woman calling for help. She heard a background conversation. There was a man with her who seemed to be out of his head and he was struggling to get out of wherever they were and she was struggling with him. And he was grabbing the mic and saying things and, and it, the, the whole thing reads like a modern 911 call. Very confusing. And some of the things don't seem to make any sense like there are several places in the notebook where Betty wrote, New York, New York. And we asked her, what did you mean, New York, New York? She says, well, that's the way I write New York City. To me, that was, that was New York, New York, New York City. Or something that sounded like New York City. Oh, that shipwreck on the reef at Gardner Island? Is the SS Norwich City. Betty's notebook is full of what we call occult information. It's information that Betty could not possibly have that does link to what appears to be Earhart's situation out there. All right, so how do we test this hypothesis? If that airplane was transmitting from the reef at Gardner Island, there must be a place, well, maybe it's a reef, maybe it's not, but there must be a place on Gardner where the aircraft could be landed safely. The aircraft must arrive with enough fuel to keep the battery charged. The transmission of the credible signals must correspond to times when the battery-equipped engine could be run. And there must be a reasonable explanation for why the aircraft was not seen by the Navy searchers or later inhabitants. All these things have to, bases have to be covered. Well, you can't land on the beach. Well, where can you land? Well, you can't land in that area up there. That's, uh, that's really soft. It's full of crab holes. The airplane would flip over on its back. Uh, there's another area down here that would be okay. The northern reef is, is very pockmarked and a lot of stuff washed. That's not good. There's some really smooth reef down here, and there's some smooth reef up here. Okay. So there is, okay, we can check that out. There are places where you could land. Now, they've got to have enough fuel. Well, one of the things we found by doing computer modeling, we're back to science again, computer modeling of the airplane's antenna systems, we find that if the Itasca heard her at maximum strength like they said they did, she can't be right on top of Howland like they thought she might be. She's got to be at least eh, 180, 200 miles away. 
So she starts, she's not as close, she's, she might be a lot closer to Gardner than anybody dreamt she was. This is what we think happened. The stronger winds moved, pushed them south during the night because there was an overcast, they couldn't get celestial observations. When the sun comes up, Noonan can get his line of position, he advances it, he gets to the line, doesn't see Holland, he can afford to go north for a little ways, then he has to go south, and at that point, they've got three hours and 35 minutes of fuel remaining, it's gonna take them an hour and 15 minutes to reach Gardner, although they don't know they're gonna reach Gardner. They're hoping they're up north of Holland and they're gonna reach Holland, but at least if they go this way, there's another possibility Let's give them another 15 minutes to check out the island and land. So they land with two hours and five minutes of fuel remaining. That's 104 gallons. She got lots of gas. Not enough to go back to Holland, but uh, she's got gas. The transmission times of the credible signals must correspond to times when the generator-equipped engine could be run. So there they are, parked on the reef, and the tide comes in and the time go tide goes out. And they can't run the engine if the prop's going to hit the water. You can't do that. And if the water gets high enough to hit the transmitter, they're through. Well, let's, we calculate the tide. We hind cast the tides. We survey the reef. And that was a lot of fun, I can tell you. And we plot out day, night. This is the first night. The green lines are the credible radio signals. And you can see that they only occur when the water level is well below the propeller clearance limit and the next day, and the next day. The correlation is incredible. And then they kind of peter out, they're still low, but the, the tide's coming in and getting higher and higher. The last one is early on the morning of July 7th, and then there's nothing, and then the Navy planes fly over on the yellow line on the 9th. The airplane's gone by now, and the signals have stopped. Well, why didn't the Navy see the airplane? There's got to be a credible explanation. We've got these places where the airplane could have landed, but they didn't see an airplane on the reef or, um, or on the land. So the only, and it, nobody ever found one on the land later because the island was inhabited for a while. The only place for the airplane to go was in the water. But where in the water? Where do we look in the water for the airplane? Well, but rising tides wash it into the ocean. Okay, fine. Emily Sikuli in Fiji, anecdotal recollection. He was, she was the um, carpenter's daughter on Nicomaro in 1940. And we were interviewing her in 1999, and she told us uh, that when she was a kid, her father, the island, car island carpenter, was taking her on a walk along the beach looking for trees he could cut, and he pointed out to the ocean and see, said, see that wreckage, that rusty old stuff out there, right out there? Uh, that's an airplane, he told her. It really made an impression on her, and she marked a map for us. Anecdotal, eh, maybe she's right, maybe she's not. Eh, but let's, let's keep that in mind. Let's, let's go and look at that area. Well, boy, you could land an airplane here. Yeah, it's, it's all that's left of the shipwreck now. You could land anything there. You could roller skate on that. Um, huh. Yeah, there's a whole area there. It could be almost like an airstrip. Maybe this is what happened. Maybe that's where she landed. Three months later, October 37, the British get around to checking out the island for future settlement. And they took a bunch of pictures, and this is one of them. They were taking a picture of the shipwreck. But there's something that shouldn't be there. There's something sticking up out of the water on the reef. On an uninhabited island, this is 37. There shouldn't be anything sticking up out of the reef. We went to Oxford, England, where the original photograph is, and our forensic imaging specialist, Jeff Glickman, took very highly detailed photographs of this, and we compared it, took measurements. Jeff says, Rick, I think we've got the wreckage of a Lockheed Electra landing gear. At which point I said, uh oh, whoa, this is way too much. We've got to have a separate opinion. I need somebody who doesn't have a dog in the fight. I need an expert that can help us. So. Uh, we, we kept looking. We, we also see that when she wrecked the airplane in Hawaii, one of the landing gear came off the airplane. And it came apart the same way that's implied by this photo of the island. We, 
we had some good connections at the State Department. They agreed to have their photo analysts look at it. Uh, they did their own research, called me in, and said, yeah, we see pretty much what your guy sees. We can't say for sure that this is Lockheed Electro landing gear, but that's what it looks like. And of course, they wouldn't let us talk about it. If, if the people we really work for knew we were working on stuff like this, we'd have all kinds of trouble. Okay, fine, guys. Yeah. But uh, they did tell the Assistant Secretary of State that had given him the job, and he couldn't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> and then the, the word got out. And we, um, it turns out where this thing is is right where Emily marked the map. All right. Now we know where the airplane landed. We know what went in the water, left a landing gear behind for a while. There's nothing there now, of course. So we know where to look. The hypo hypothesis is supported. All of our check marks check out. The original hypothesis is supported. All right. Now what do we do about it? We do an expedition. We test the hypothesis. There's the search area. That's what it looks like down there. This is really tough country. We, did, we tried it the first time in 2012 with an ROV, with a, a tether, high definition cameras. Looking for stuff underwater with an ROV is like searching for your car keys, lost car keys in a pasture at night with a flashlight looking through a toilet paper tube. That's a $2 million expedition. So we're going back with the University of Hawaii subs. That's the way to search it. Brains and eyeballs down there. It's, there's a couch you're going to be on, Dwayne. On, on my belly. On your belly. But you get a great field of view. You've got perspective. We've got the search area divided up into seven swaths, 250 meters by 1,000 meters, two and a half million square meters to be covered. The one sub goes deep. The other one starts about halfway. You always work with two subs because the great danger is that the sub gets entangled, and you've got to be able to disentangle it. The big downside to using manned submersibles is that with ROVs and other technology, if things go south, you lose a really expensive piece of equipment. Things go wrong here, people die. University of Hawaii ship Kaimikai o Kanaloa, KOK, is designed to support the subs. We will have, uh, KOK has a crew of 12. There will be the Hawaii Undersea Research Lab, the, the sub team has nine people. And there will be 10 tigers. That's 30 souls. We're 1,800 miles. I've done it. It's nine days each way, 18 days to go down and come back. We'll have 12 days on site, which is about twice the time it should take us to cover that area. But I know Nicomararo well enough to know if you're out there and something can break, it will break. We'll be 30 days at sea. Unless we find stuff earlier, we can come home earlier. And it's going to cost about one and three quarter million dollars. That's the way it is. But it's out there. We know where it went. We know how to look. We are shooting for the obvious date, which is the 80th anniversary of the disappearance, July 2nd. Um, we got a lot of money to raise. And we're going to do it. And we're going to find that airplane. Thank you.